Analytical Chemistry 2.0 by David Harvey. Chapter 4. Section 4. F. Statistical Methods for Normal Distributions. The most common distribution for our results is a normal distribution. Because the area between any two limits of a normal distribution is well defined, constructing and evaluating significance tests is straightforward. Section 4F.1 Comparing X bout mu. One approach for validating a new analytical method is to analyze a sample containing a known amount of analyte, mu. To judge the method's accuracy, we analyze several portions of the sample, determine the average amount of analyte in the sample, X bar and use a significance test to compare it to mu. Our null hypothesis, H0, x bar is equal to mu, is that any difference between x bar and mu is the result of indeterminate errors affecting the determination of x bar. The alternative hypothesis, HA, x bar is not equal to mu, is that the difference between x bar and mu is too large to be explained by indeterminate error. The test statistic is txp which we substitute into the confidence interval for mu, equation 4.12. Mu is equal to x bar plus or minus dx times s divided by the square root of n. Rearranging this equation and solving for dx, tx is equal to the absolute value of mu minus x bar times the square root of n all divided by s gives the value of dx when mu is at either the right edge or the loose edge of the sample s confidence interval, figure 4.14a. To determine if we should retain or reject the null hypothesis, we compare the value of dx to a critical value, t, alpha, nu, where alpha is the confidence level and nu is the degrees of freedom for the sample. The critical value t, alpha, nu, defines the largest confidence interval resulting from indeterminate errors. If dx is greater than t, alpha, nu, then our sample s confidence interval is too large to be explained by indeterminate errors, figure 4.14b. In this case, we reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. If dx is less than or equal to t, alpha, nu, then the confidence interval for our sample can be explained in indeterminate error, and we retain the null hypothesis, figure 4.14c. Example 4.16 provides a typical application of this significance test, which is known as a t-test of x bar to mu. Earlier we made the point that you need to exercise caution when interpreting the results of a statistical analysis. We will keep returning to this point because it is an important one. Having determined that a result is inaccurate, as we did in example 4.16, the next step is to identify and to correct the error. Before expending time and money on this, however, you should first critically examine your data. For example, the smaller the value of s, the larger the value of tx. If the standard deviation for your analysis is unrealistically small, the probability of a type 2 error increases. Including a few additional replicate analysis of the standard, and re-evaluating the t-test may strengthen your evidence for a determinate error, or it may show that there is no evidence for a determinate error. Section 4F.2 Comparing S squared to sigma squared. If we regularly analyze a particular sample, we may be able to establish the expected variance, sigma squared, for the analysis. This often is the case, for example, in clinical labs that routinely analyze hundreds of blood samples each day. A few replicate analysis of a single sample gives a sample variance, S squared, whose value may or may not differ significantly from sigma squared. We can use an F-test to evaluate whether a difference between S squared and sigma squared is significant. The null hypothesis is H0. S squared is equal to sigma squared, and the alternative hypothesis is HA. S squared is not equal to sigma squared. The test statistic for evaluating the null hypothesis is Fx, which is given as either Fx is equal to S squared over sigma squared when S squared is greater than sigma squared or fx is equal to sigma squared over s squared when s squared is less than sigma squared, depending on whether s squared is larger or smaller than sigma squared. This way of defining fx ensures that its value is always greater than or equal to 1. If the null hypothesis is true, then fx should equal 1. Because of indeterminate errors, however, fx usually is greater than 1. A critical value, f, 
alpha, nu num, nu den, gives the largest value of fxp that we can attribute to indeterminate error. It is chosen for a specified significance level, alpha, and for the degrees of freedom for the variance in the numerator, nu num, and the variance in the denominator, nu den. The degrees of freedom for s squared is n minus 1, where n is the number of replicates used to determine the sample s variance, and the degrees of freedom for sigma squared is infinity. Critical values of f for alpha equals 0 0.05 are listed in appendix 5 for both one-tailed and two-tailed def tests. Section 4f.3 Comparing two sample variances We can extend the f-test to compare the variances for two samples, a and b, by rewriting equation 4.16 as fx is equal to sa squared over sb squared, defining a and b so that the value of fx is greater than or equal to 1. Section 4f.4 Comparing two sample means Three factors influence the result of an analysis. The method, the sample, and the analyst. We can study the influence of these factors by conducting experiments in which we change one of the factors, while holding the others constant. For example, to compare two analytical methods we can have the same analyst apply each method to the same sample, and then examine the resulting means. In a similar fashion, we can design experiments to compare analysts, or to compare samples, before we consider the significance tests for comparing the means of two samples, we need to make a distinction between unpaired data and paired data. This is a critical distinction and learning to distinguish between the two types of data is important. Here are two simple examples that highlight the difference between unpaired data and paired data. In each example the goal is to compare two balances by weighing pennies. Example 1. Collect 10 pennies and weigh each penny on each balance. This is an example of paired data, because we use the same 10 pennies to evaluate each balance. Example 2. Collect 10 pennies and divide them into two groups of 5 pennies each. Weigh the pennies in the first group on one balance, and weigh the second group of pennies on the other balance. Note that no penny is weighed on both balances. This is an example of unpaired data, because we evaluate each balance using a different sample of pennies. In both examples the samples of pennies are from the same population. The difference is how we sample the population. We will learn why this distinction is important when we review the significance test for paired data. First, however, we present the significance test for unpaired data. Unpaired data. Consider two analyses, A and B, with means of X bar A and X bar B, and standard deviations of SA and SB. The confidence intervals for mu a and for mu b are mu a is equal to x bar a plus or minus d times s a over the square root of n a and mu b is equal to x bar b plus or minus d times s b over the square root of n b where n a and n b are the sample sizes for a and b a null hypothesis h0 mu a is equal to mu b is that in any difference between mu a and mu b is the result of indeterminate errors affecting the analysis? The alternative hypothesis, h a, mu a is not equal to mu b, is that the difference between mu a and mu b means is too large to be explained by indeterminate error. To derive an equation for dxp, we assume that mu a equals mu b, and combine equations 4.17 and 4.18. x a, plus or minus dxp, times s a, over the square root of n a is equal to x b plus or minus d x p times s b over the square root of n b. Solving for the absolute value of x a minus x b and using a propagation of uncertainty gives the absolute value of x a minus x b is equal to t x p multiplied by the square root of s a squared over n a plus s b squared over n b. Finally, we solve for t x p t x b is equal to the absolute value of x a minus x b over the square root of s a squared over n a plus s b squared over n b and compare it to a critical value t alpha nu where alpha is the probability of a type 1 error and nu is the degrees of freedom. Thus far our development of this t test is similar to that for comparing x bar to mu and yet we do not have enough information to evaluate the t test. Do you see the problem? 
with two independent sets of data it is unclear how many degrees of freedom we have. Suppose that the variance is SA squared and SB squared provide estimates of the same sigma squared. In this case we can replace SA squared and SB squared with a pooled variance, S pool squared, that provides a better estimate for the variance. Thus, equation 4.20 becomes Tx is equal to the absolute value of xA minus xB over S pool multiplied by the square root of 1 over Na plus 1 over Nb, which is equal to the absolute value of xA minus xB over S pool multiplied by the square root of Na and B over Na plus Nb, where S pool, the pool standard deviation, is S pool is equal to the square root of Na minus 1 times SA squared plus NB minus 1 times SB squared all over Na plus NB minus 2. The denominator of equation 4.22 shows us that the degrees of freedom for a pool standard deviation is Na plus NB minus 2, which also is the degrees of freedom for the t test. If SA squared and SB squared are significantly different, we must calculate Tx using equation 4.20. In this case, we find the degrees of freedom using the following imposing equation. Nu is equal to SA squared over NA plus SB squared over NB all squared over SA squared over NA all squared divided by NA plus 1 plus SB squared over NB all squared divided by nb plus 1, minus 2. Since the degrees of freedom must be an integer, we round to the nearest integer the value of n obtained using equation 4.23. Regardless of whether we calculate tx using equation 4.20 or equation 4.21, we reject the null hypothesis. If tx is greater than t, alpha, nu, and retain the null hypothesis. If tx is less than or equal to t, alpha, nu, paired data, Suppose we are evaluating a new method for monitoring blood glucose concentrations in patients. An important part of evaluating a new method is to compare it to an established method. What is the best way to gather data for this study? Because the variation in the blood glucose levels amongst patients is large we may be unable to detect a small but significant difference between the methods if we use different patients to gather data for each method using paired data in which the we analyze each patient's blood using both methods, prevents a large variance within a population from adversely affecting a t-test of means. When using paired data we first calculate the difference, di, between the paired values for each sample. Using these difference values, we then calculate the average difference, d-bar, and the standard deviation of the differences, sd, the null hypothesis, h0 d bar is equal to zero is that there is no difference between the two samples and the alternative hypothesis h a d bar is not equal to zero is that the difference between the two samples is significant the test statistic t exp is derived from a confidence interval around d bar t exp is equal to the absolute value of d multiplied by the square root of n all over s d where n is the number of paired samples as is true for other forms of the t-test, we compare the x to t, alpha, nu, where the degrees of freedom, nu, is n minus 1. If t x is greater than t, alpha, nu, then we reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. We retain the null hypothesis. If t x is less than or equal to t, alpha, nu, this is known as a paired t-test. One important requirement for a paired t-test is that determinate and indeterminate errors affecting the analysis must be independent of the analyte's concentration. If this is not the case, then a sample with an unusually high concentration of analyte will have an unusually large di. Including this sample in the calculation of d-bar and sd leads to a biased estimate of the expected mean and standard deviation. This is rarely a problem for samples spanning a limited range of analyte concentrations, such as those in example 4.21 or practice exercise 4.11. When paired data span a wide range of concentrations, however, the magnitude of the determinate and indeterminate sources of error may not be independent of the analyte's concentration. 
In such cases, a PERD t-test may give misleading results since the PERD data with the largest absolute determinate and indeterminate errors will dominate the bar. In this situation, a regression analysis, which is the subject of the next chapter, is more appropriate method for comparing the data. Section 4F.5 Outliers Earlier in the chapter, we examined several data sets consisting of the mass of a circulating United States penny. Table 4.16 provides one more data set. Do you notice anything unusual in this data? Of the 112 pennies included in Table 4.11 and Table 4.13, no penny weighed less than 3 grams. In Table 4.16, however, the mass of one penny is less than 3 grams. We might ask whether this penny's mass is so different from the other pennies that it is in error. Data that are not consistent with the remaining data are called outliers. An outlier might exist for many reasons. The outlier might be from a different population. Is this a Canadian penny? The outlier might be a contaminated or otherwise altered sample. Is the penny damaged? Or the outlier may result from an error in the analysis. Did we forget to tear the balance? Regardless of its source, the presence of an outlier compromises any meaningful analysis of our data. There are many significance tests for identifying potential outliers, three of which we present here. Dixon SQ Test One of the most common significance tests for outliers is Dixon SQ Test. The null hypothesis is that there are no outliers, and the alternative hypothesis is that there is an outlier. The Q test compares the gap between the suspected outlier and its nearest numerical neighbor to the range of the entire data set, figure 4.15. The test statistic, QXP, is QXP is equal to the gap over the range which is equal to the absolute value of the outlier s value minus the nearest value over the largest value minus the smallest value. This equation is appropriate for evaluating a single outlier. Other forms of Dixon SQ test allow its extension to detecting multiple outliers. The value of QXP is compared to a critical value, Q, alpha, n, where alpha is the probability of rejecting a valid data point, a type 1 error and n is the total number of data points. To protect against rejecting a valid data point, we usually apply the more conservative two-tailed Q-test, even though the possible outlier is the smallest or the largest value in the data set. If Qxp is greater than Q, alpha, n, then we reject the null hypothesis and may exclude the outlier. We retain the possible outlier when Qxp is less than or equal to Q, alpha, n, Table 4.17 provides values for Q, 0.05, N, for a sample containing from 3 to 10 values. A more extensive table is in Appendix 6. Values for Q, alpha, N, assume an underlying normal distribution. Grubbs test. Although Dixon SQ test is a common method for evaluating outliers, it is no longer favored by the International Standards Organization, ISO, which now recommends Grubbs test. There are several versions of Grubb S test depending on the number of potential outliers. Here we will consider the case where there is a single suspected outlier. The test statistic for Grubb S test, GXP, is the distance between the sample S mean, X, and the potential outlier, X out, in terms of the sample S standard deviation, S. GXP is equal to the absolute value of X out, minus X bar, over S, we compare the value of Gx to a critical value G, alpha, n, where alpha is the probability of rejecting a valid data point and n is the number of data points in the sample. If Gx is greater than G, alpha, n, we may reject the data point as an outlier, otherwise we retain the data point as part of the sample. Table 4.18 provides values for G, 0.05, n, for a sample containing from 3 to 10 values, a more extensive table is in Appendix 7. Values for G, alpha, n, assume an underlying normal distribution. Chauvinot test criterion. Our final method for identifying outliers is Chauvinot test criterion. Unlike Dixon SQ test and Grubb S test, you can apply this method to any distribution, as long as you know how to calculate the probability for a particular outcome. Chauvinot test criterion states that we can reject a data point if the probability of obtaining the data point s value is less than 2n to the minus 1, where n is the size of the sample. 
For example, if n equals 10, a result with a probability of less than 2 times 10 to the minus 1, or 0 0.05, is considered an outlier. To calculate a potential outlier rest probability we first calculate its standardized deviation, z. z is equal to the absolute value of x out minus x bar over s. Where x out is the potential outlier, x bar is the sample s mean and s is the sample s standard deviation. Note that this equation is identical to the equation for g x in the grub s test. For a normal distribution, you can find the probability of obtaining a value of z using the probability table in Appendix 3. You should exercise caution when using a significance test for outliers, because there is a chance you will reject a valid result. In addition, you should avoid rejecting an outlier if it leads to a precision that is unreasonably better than that expected based on a propagation of uncertainty. Given these two concerns it is not surprising that some statisticians caution against the removal of outliers. On the other hand, testing for outliers can provide useful information if you try to understand the source of the suspected outlier. For example, the outlier in Table 4.16 represents a significant change in the mass of a penny, an approximately 17% decrease in mass, which is the result of a change in the composition of the U.S. penny. In 1982 the composition of a U.S. penny was changed from a brass alloy consisting of 95 weight percent of copper and 5 weight percent of zinc to a zinc core covered with copper. The pennies in Table 4.16, therefore, were drawn from different populations 